This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters at patreon.com and by the Socialism 2020 Conference, which is taking place this July 2nd through 5th in Chicago. The Socialism Conference is the largest socialism conference in North America. It is where activists and organizers come to be inspired, to learn from each other, and to develop the political tools that make our movements stronger. This July 2nd through 5th, Socialism 2020 will feature meetings and discussions on the recent revolutionary movements around the globe, the history of black radicalism, Marxist theory and socialist history, trans liberation, and the fight to save our planet from climate catastrophe. Speakers at Socialism 2020 include Robin D.G. Kelly, Crystal Ball, Rosanna Rodriguez, Anand Gopal, Kate Aronoff, Richard Seymour, Sarah Jaffe, Megan Day, me, Daniel Denver, and many more. Socialism 2020 is organized by Haymarket Books, Jacobin, and the Democratic Socialists of America. Visit socialismconference.org to register today. That's socialismconference.org. Register before May 8th for the early bird discount rate. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Oftentimes, Trump's election is explained with one simple word, racism. That's not at all wrong, but it is woefully insufficient. Racism is not always the same, and the shape that it takes is not inevitable. Racism is not a static force, just as race is not a biological reality. Racism, like race, has histories. It has context. Racism does different sorts of work at different moments. Of course, racism helped Trump secure the presidency. But that's not an answer. Rather, it's part of a question. My guests today are Joe Lowndes and Daniel Martinez Hosang, and their new book, Producers, Parasites, Patriots, Race and the New Right-Wing Politics of Precarity, provides a comprehensive analysis of how racism has morphed to function in new and often quite weird ways amid the crises of neoliberal capitalism and empire. From street fighters of color in the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer to right-wing black members of Congress like Tim Scott and Mia Love, right-wing racist reaction has taken on its own version of multiculturalism. Meanwhile, racist frameworks developed to justify the domination of black people have been applied to poor whites and to white public employees. To fight and defeat the racist right, we must first understand it clearly. Hosang and Lowndes' new book does just that. Before we get started, I want to ask you, the person listening to me right now, for your support at patreon.com slash the dig. This podcast is overwhelmingly a listener-supported operation, and so if you haven't done so yet, please donate now. What's more, we have left-wing books to send you in the mail if you contribute at least $10 a month. One of those books is A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. If you appreciate what we do at The Dig, please take a moment and navigate your web browser to patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. I also have a bunch of upcoming events for my book, All American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explains Politics as We Know It. Coming up really soon is Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. Philly at the Wooden Shoe on February 24th with immigration historian Carly Goodman. And then I'll be in Mount Ephraim, New Jersey on the 25th at Gallery 88. D.C. at Solid State Books in conversation with journalist Dara Lind 
on February 26th. And then again on February 27th at Metro DC DSA's Socialist Night School. And then Baltimore on February 28th at Red Emma's in conversation with Christy Thornton. Okay, here's Daniel Martinez Hosang and Joe Lounce, the authors of Producers, Parasites, Patriots Race and the New Right Wing Politics of Precarity. Daniel Martinez Hosang is professor of ethnicity, race, and migration and American studies at Yale, where he researches and teaches about the contradictory labor of race within U.S. political culture. Joe Lowndes is a professor of political science at the University of Oregon and a member of United Academics AAUP AFT Local 3209, who researches and writes on race, populism, and right-wing politics in the United States. And a quick note so that you can tell my two guests apart— Keep in mind that Daniel Martinez Hosang is the first person to answer my first question. And then Joe Lounce is the second one to answer. Joe Lounce and Daniel Martinez Hosang, welcome to The Dig. Oh, thanks for having us. Thanks, Dan. Your book is about the changing politics of race in the United States, and the basic premise of such an argument is that race and racism indeed have histories and context, which is contrary to a commonplace liberal approach that frames racism as this static force and thus implicitly race as a static force as well. You write, quote, While racial subordination is an enduring feature of U.S. political history, it continually changes in response to shifting social and political conditions, interests, and structures. And, quote, race performs dynamic and often contradictory work, continuing to produce hierarchy and exclusion, while also generating new forms of mobility and incorporation. Like all forms of common sense, Racism is a composite formation, bearing vestiges of bygone dynamics, as well as traces of emerging developments. To start off, let's cover your your general argument. What is so different about racism and the work that race does right now? And how does that, in turn, shed light on how race and racism have functioned under capitalism more generally? Well, I think there's a a dominant story uh, in the post-war U.S., that um, understands that race was key to the formation of modern conservatism itself and a kind of sorting of both working, middle, and professional class people into categories of deservingness and undeservingness. And the category white was often reserved for those who could expect some benefit of social remuneration status, et cetera. That legacy, and we see it in home ownership, we see it in access to education, we see it in household wealth, is formidable, strong, and enduring. But the capacity of the the same market to simply sort people into those static categories is partly what's come under some duress and change, and that's partly what we're uh, tracking here. Yeah, and so in terms of its relationship to capitalism more broadly, those those two questions are uh, deeply interrelated because capitalism is also always a dynamic force changing under, you know, changing historical conditions. And insofar as, you know, the invention of race and the onset of capitalism go hand in hand, as numerous scholars and historians have have uh, written about, you can expect that in in changes in uh, the economy uh, or changes in racial discourse, you'll see you know concomitant changes in you know race or capitalism. So uh, under conditions today of kind of extreme neoliberal gaps in wealth, you know now it would. would people refer to as the second Gilded Age, we see this kind of like, you know, yawning space between uh, the very richest and everyone else. Race is going to be mobilized to respond in new ways to these new conditions. And so that's partly what we're tracking is this moment is kind of a conjuncture where uh, many uh, codes are scrambled and social relations are shifting. And under those conditions, um, new forms of racialization, new forms of racial expression, and new forms of political articulations which under which race, uh, race is expressed in new ways. 
there's this ahistorical conceptualization of racism that has led to this argument of an almost automatic white lash that bringing Trump to office, which presumes that demographic change automatically provokes a racist response and thus also treats as natural the demographic categories that are in reality, of course, socially constructed. It's part of this entire misguided debate that we've been subjected to for the last few years over whether it was either economic anxiety or racism that made Trump president. You write, quote, Trump offered a narrative about the debasement of whiteness, recited through accounts of state failure, an anemic military, the loss of national economic standing, and the incursion of racialized foreigners into the U.S. polity. Trump was a reaction to, quote, the declining guarantees that whiteness has provided, fears of economic decline and economic status, animated white voters across income levels, fears made meaningful through appeals to racism, nativism, and the power to exclude. I want to repeat three words from that quote, across income levels, because the economics of racism, contrary to this these conventional narratives, are never just a story about the white working class. How does your argument about this crisis in whiteness, about whiteness failing to protect white people as advertised, make sense of racism as what Stuart Hall called the modality in which classes lived? And how does that depart from this conventional liberal framework? Well, part of what you're raising is the limits of an understanding of racism simply as a psychological orientation and something that's com- somehow like reflexive, innate, and under certain conditions kind of automatically mobilized. And so uh, versus an understanding that these are political projects that require collective effort to uh, mobilize, um, to identify, to demonize, to incorporate – so in the case, there it actually is quite empirically true that there is that whiteness as a kind of form of guaranteed protection has declining benefits. Across the post-war era, it was often associated with access to institutions, some form of protection and redistribution. As the economy itself has redistributed upward, those protections for everyone are lost. Whether we understand them, therefore, as a structural consequence of the economy – or as a violation of some kind of white right to status and hierarchy is part of what's up for grabs. And our argument is that Trump is part of a broader movement to try to make an argument that uh, to the extent that people who think of themselves as white face growing precarity, it's a reassertion of their whiteness and what it might invoke for them that their kind of uh, fortunes would lie. So – and this this can go across – class categories too, right? I mean, the idea that you have are experiencing relative deprivation might mean that, you know, you fear that your stagnant wages are the result of immigrant workers uh, undercutting you, uh, you know, in the market. Or it might be that you uh, feel like your kid didn't get into an Ivy League school because of affirmative action programs. And so, you know, up and down the economic scale, Appeals can be made to whiteness in terms of who gets in in front of you or who's, who's benefiting at your expense. Or it might be what, where are your tax dollars going? Who's, who's spending that? Who's parasitic on your, uh, on your own life and well-being and flourishing? You just mentioned this, but you write about that the post-World War II whiteness was organized around this economic relationship to the state, something that we can see clearly with the history of white ethnics who were for much of American history – demonized, but became white in a sense during this period by becoming middle class, or at least economically stable. You write about welfare reform in the 1990s, quote, white racial identity had become so thoroughly associated with autonomy, self-sufficiency, and independence that a public effort premised on making poor households even more vulnerable and insecure was perceived as a defense of white economic autonomy, even as the majority of households receiving such benefits were white. But on the other hand, quote, all of these appeals depended upon the economic stability of those white voters, such that those voters would associate economic vulnerability with black and brown communities in poverty. There's sort of a tension here because there's a certain type of anti-welfare politics that depended on the security of the white wage paid by the New Deal order. But 
how then did that order's collapse remake this racist ideology? Did the contradiction between the promised racial status and the live reality prove explosive? Like what happens to whiteness when its delivery of the literal economic wage comes into to doubt? Part of it is if you think about the New Deal guarantees or the kind of social safety net set up for you know, a broad swath of Americans, and particularly people who were white Americans, in, uh, from the 1930s onward, uh, depended on uh, notions of entitlement and deservedness, right? So there was, even in New Deal social policy, there is a split between social security and uh, relief, or job guarantees and government provided jobs. And so there's you know across this across this era what was per, you know what was perceived as white white social guarantees and provisions were ones that were thought to be you know that you you know you you paid your wage into social security and so you get some of that back that's an entitlement as opposed to what someone else is doing. And so it wasn't marked as it wasn't marked as redistribution. It wasn't marked as redistribution and it wasn't marked as as relief and I mean that's key to one of the arguments we make in the book is that uh, this notion of producerism, of being a producer, is structured racially, and it's the it's what authorizes an idea that one's basic rights are uh, are, are premised on uh, what you uh, you know what you contribute to the economy, what you do, one, your own kind of in, in moral or cultural terms, your work ethic, and so this is partly what you know after the 1960s. When there's a welfare rights movement, when there are uh, demands for uh, black and brown inclusion into all aspects of public goods in the United States, up to universities, uh, once that once those challenges are made, then the, the very nature of public goods comes under uh, attack, and the right is able to uh, use that is to say that well, actually, you know, these guarantees, these New Deal era guarantees, this this kind of mid 20th century. Uh, liberal policy is now is sullied by its uh, by, you know by its extension to these other groups. So that in, in the right w- y- frames it that way to attack public goods as such, to, and to and to make a case for a market anti-statism. So racism and a logic of race drives broader justifications for neoliberal economic policy. Yeah, and that it's a subsidy that's uh, come at the expense of the producing class. Yes. So it has to be understood as a loss in some ways. This analysis reminds me of, of Du Bois's comment that, quote, the black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. In a sense, does that analysis also apply to race being constituted vis-a-vis different groups, rela- economic relationships to to the state? And then if it does, what does that mean when so many people fall outside of that category, when they're when they're white people who in their economic relationship to the state fall into the category marked as black. Yeah, that's right. I think it helps us to think about race as standing in for capacities, um, for what's possible uh, for a person. And, you know, the intensification of inequality is now such that, you know, these large, large sections of white workers who uh, understood themselves to be entitled to some of that redistribution through mechanisms like unions, their public benefit programs. The the question that we're trying to wrestle with is how do you legitimate their abandonment and in some ways, quite concretely, their death? The narratives, the attacks, the logics, the forms of common sense that were long developed to explain why many people of color were excluded, not because of some social organization, but because of their incapacities, their degeneracies, why they would be excluded, for example, from housing subsidies, education subsidies, et cetera. Those are at the ready now when you want to try to explain why white public sector workers are themselves parasitic. They sit around uh, feeding at the trough of the value created by the uh, the private sector. Or tuition subsidies at public colleges or other forms of guarantee. So the very logics that were used to legitimate uh, white access to social benefits now come back zombie-like to explain their uh, abandonment. This is this process that you call racial transposition. And you write that there's been, quote, a growing tendency to advance cultural and even biological explanations for the expansion of white vulnerability, placing a greater number of whites 
in discursive categories once reserved for people of color as white poverty is increasingly explained through explanations of dependence, criminality, family disorganization, and genetic deficiency. And you look back at the sort of analysis that, that, that Moynihan employed in his infamous 1965 The Negro Family, a.k.a. The Moynihan Report, how that's been come to be applied to poor whites. You cite the book by the Bell Curve author Charles Murray from 2012, Coming Apart. And then since Trump's election, we've had Hillbilly Elegy and also this article on Appalachia in the National Review by Kevin Williamson, The White Ghetto. And I, I want to quote from it because it's really remarkable. Uh, where he writes, quote, you have the pills and the dope, the morning beers, the federally funded ritual of trading cases of food stamp Pepsi for packs of Kentucky's best cigarettes and good old hard currency, the occasional blast of meth, petty crime, the draw welfare, recreational making and surgical unmaking of teenaged mothers and death. If the people here weren't 98.5% white, we call it a reservation. What do you make of the fact that we, we simultaneously tr- see Trump and Tucker Carlson blaming racialized others for white people's economic problems, but then other conservatives blaming poor white people as though they are those racialized others? H- how do these two seemingly contradictory things function together? I mean, isn't it interesting that going back just for a moment to the Kevin Williamson quote, The only way that he can make sense of this is to use terms like ghetto and reservation, right? That the white failure he wants to describe, it doesn't make sense unless you can actually slot it into racial categories for the reader. And so, you know, there already he's like, the only way to to move us to that place is to be like, now you, you must see these as racialized subjects in some way. And so that's, you know, that's partly what was happening, you know, these... You know, Charles Murray's book and Kevin Williamson's articles in the National Review and elsewhere are kind of happening across the 2000s and, you know, uh, the first two decades of the 21st century, seeing more and more of this. As as conservative writers are trying to come to terms with and justify greater greater inequalities and white failure at the bottom to uh, keep up with, with economic changes. So, you know, partly when we're writing this book, we, we began this before Trump was elected or started winning uh, Republican primaries. And uh, it was a question at that point, like, what, how will these, for us, we were kind of thinking, well, how, you know, how will people who are now being racially marked in novel ways respond to this kind of marking, respond to uh, where they're being placed? And, you know, Trump was one answer to that. Trumpism, Trump says, Trump makes appeals in early Republican primaries uh, to disaffected and unemployed white workers. He does it across the primaries. You know, when he, we saw him speak in, at a rally, his one big rally in Oregon, and he starts off by reading off a list of, of paper mill closures, speaking to a room where there's many unemployed former you know, people, workers in the timber industry. And so, you know, Trump is, in some ways was appealing to these people on the basis of, you know, you've been abandoned by party elites. You've been abandoned by Jeb Bush, by Mitt Romney, by other Republican chieftains who who represent neoliberal capital. I represent something else to you. And it was a a message that was uh, simultaneously aimed uh, rhetorically at free trade agreements and at immigrants and people of color. So there there was a way in which he was telling people, actually, both telling people that they could, there could be a restoration of the privileges of their whiteness through a Trump victory. But he was also calling them losers. He was also using, interestingly, a language which was not so different from Kevin Williamson's. He would say on the campaign trail over and over, you're losers, you're losers. And which was kind of, at the time, I wrote uh, in a piece in Counterpunch that this was really an odd form of populism, kind of a new kind of populism where you appeal to the, to the very people. BDSM pop. <laughs> BDSM yes. populism. I think that's exactly true. There's a way in which there were certain kinds of pleasures in this kind of continual recitation of, of people's own uh, humiliations. Uh, this kind of demeaning language was uh, oddly part of what was a staple of his appeal early on. 
Right. And not, I mean, you actually spoke in the, we said, we're losers. We keep losing at everything. We lose to the Chinese. We lose to, the, they laugh at us. They mock us. And that was rather than we might think like, in, you know, in comparison to Hillary, who said we are already great in that way. And there's a way that that had much more kind of, it was much more attuned and resonant to these feelings of loss and reframed it as racial loss. Yeah, I mean, not to get like too psychoanalytic, but hey, maybe let's go there. People are laughing at us. He says that constantly and maybe not as much today, but during the campaign, certainly. And it's just this reflects this obsession with humiliation at the hands of the foreign racialized other. Mm -hmm. And women. I mean, there's this. The other thing here is that gender and race are continually wrapped up together in in, in these languages. Oh, yeah. And I want to get to that uh, big time later on. But first, I want to talk about that. Another big example of racial transposition that you discuss alongside poor white people is is white public employees and the use of racist ideology to attack them. I guess let's start with the bigger picture just to set the context. Why did the right wing populist response to the 2008 economic crisis take the form of a Tea Party revolt against freeloaders and parasites? Yeah, that I mean, a couple things are really important. So uh, on the right, right wing think tanks and foundations had long had a critique since the late 60s and early 70s of public sector unions themselves as kind of rent seeking um, opportunistic actors who shouldn't legislatively be entitled to um, participate in electing a government and then bargaining with that, you know, that government. What's interesting about 2008 and its aftermath is those critiques actually get rendered not in terms of structure but in terms of culture, the cultural failures of the recipients of um, – and, and that that's actually what allows, uh, for example, Scott Walker's attacks on public sector unions in 2011, the famous you know, speech in 2008 that gave rise to the Tea Party as we're subsidizing the losers. So it becomes characterological. Santelli's rant heard right. around the world. And it's, so it's, 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 it's defined in terms of character. And if you, if you want to turn to a language of character debasement in the U.S., that language is always going to be steeped in racist assumptions, that it's somehow carried in the body and habits and traits that are reproduced uh, as explanation. So we're trying to be careful in the argument that it's not like those public sector workers are themselves losing their whiteness and the kind of protections it continues to offer, nor are they made equivalent to the forms of stigmatization and exploitation that black and brown communities have long faced. That's not the argument. But the argument is to disavow, to discredit, to demonize, they're going to have to turn to that language. And this is not something new, a phenomenon that just arises in 2008. Cedric Robinson, the theorist and social critic, you know, has written Racism has the advantage of being able to move and transfer its disaffections from one group to another without being held accountable. And he was describing this, you know, 400 years ago at the kind of uh, transition from feudalism to the transatlantic slave trade and modern capitalism. So it's a phenomenon that cultural logics and ideas can can move and are much more dynamic. They actually aren't fixed onto populations uh, as we might understand it in any given moment. So – like you mentioned, there's been this longstanding right wing attack on public employees union. But but what's new is this demonization of public employees as as people, this pathologization using the sort of frameworks previously applied to, you know, iconically like the black welfare mother to talk about white DMV employees. How did that tran- transposition take form and why did it do so when it did? Amidst and really even after 765,000 state and local public sector employees had already had their jobs cut between 2007 and 2011, it really followed this massive systematic attack in terms of the layoffs. That's right. I mean, it has to be narrated as um, the, 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 the public, the taxpaying public and private sector workers are simply sick and tired of watching their counterparts in the public sector in these do-nothing jobs at their expense. And I think it's so critical to remember at that moment how many possible explanations are circulating. Um, you know, this is when Greenspan itself is speculating about whether capitalism is capable of reproducing itself at this moment. So the fact that the narration of it is again done in terms of character, culture, qualities, actually shows the reliance of markets – 
and, you know, in, in this kind of even hyper-finance capitalism on common sense notions of worthiness and unworthiness. Um, it's deeply embedded there. I mean, this shows where uh, class and race are inseparable because you can't find a language to explain that without turning to histories of racial uh, demonization. And, and the other thing to note about this is how quickly it also subsided. Um, you know, by um, after Walker, I mean, public sector employees are held as like the kind of epitome of the budget-breaking figure who's like has to be returned to their rightful place. By 2014-15, it has very little resonance. Um, so it's it's we have to understand it as contingent, opportunistic. You know, Scott Walker's presidential ambitions go nowhere. So you know, none of these uh, again the the um, ambition to delegitimate public sector workers was long in play. But at the certain certain moment, it was this turn to languages of character deficiency that we want to uh, kind of call our attention to. You point to this instructive case where the demonization of public employees didn't work, and that's when the right went after unionized cops and firefighters in Ohio. It was 2011, and there was a massive campaign to overturn SB5, Senate Bill 5, which eviscerated public employee rights in the state. And Wisconsin conservatives, of course, didn't make that mistake. They excluded cops, and they won. And you write about the campaign in Ohio against SB5 and about their ads, which, quote, featured firefighters, police officers, and nurses amid life-threatening emergencies, evoking an iconography of white heroism and sacrifice, and within recognizably gendered occupations. We Are Ohio's credibility with voters depended on the celebrated cultural status of firefighters, police, and nurses as first responders, rather than as public service workers defending the public good. In other words, they, they won in Ohio, the unions won, but they did so by narrowly defining the legitimacy of public sector workers in right-wing terms, a, a short-term victory that reinforced a long-term problem. You write, quote, in the face of charges of parasitism, they had to quite literally perform their white producerist commitments for the electorate in order to counter the process of racial transposition. What is the problem with making cops and firefighters, in particular, the lens through which we represent public sector workers as a whole? Um, and a couple of things there. I mean, we can absolutely understand the logic in the face of a proposal that would elim broadly eliminate um, collective bargaining rights and protections for tens of thousands of workers. Why, in the short-term context of an election, you would want to front both the figures that are kind of most sympathetic to the public and that have the effect of refuting the charge that people are simply feeding off the public trough. You actually have to embody and perform the notion of the productive work you inhabit. But part of the point we're making here is that there's a whole set of workers who are critical to the public good. So we think of social workers, sometimes teachers, lots of other occupations whose labor isn't legible in those terms. And if the only grounds on which we can make claims to our right to things is by performing and reperforming our producerism, we narrow the sense in which people can be identified with it and, uh, again, can make those appeals. So I, I think this is a longstanding – you know, challenge, which is that the way you escape the disavowal, disabandonment, and stigmatization of parasitism is to present yourself as that's not me. I'm a producer. I do the work. Uh, you have me mixed up. Go after someone else. Um, but we can see over time the strategy of you go after someone else um, just simply uh, sets up other people, puts other people in the sights of that attack. Well, and it also – you've narrowed the ground of the battle to having abandoned the idea that there should be public goods, that there should be democratically controlled uh, services for everyone and that people ought to be paying into this and that people ought to be benefiting from this by, by, you know, by only focusing on kind of gendered, racialized, producerist figures, you've kind of uh, given away the argument to the other side entirely without uh, any kind of reframing of what it's going to take. So the next time these attacks come, the, the ground is even uh, uh, more shaky. And that the state is really only there to protect you from threats in an emergency. 
in these narrow, acute emergency situations. And it's absolutely reproducing the legitimacy of the producer versus parasite divide. It, you know, it presumes that. We, we also describe um, – Teachers rally in around 2013 when a group of mostly white teachers are mobilizing around a contract fight and there's a sign in the rally that says, first they came for the teachers. And that's the assumption that teachers themselves were the first to experience these accusations of being parasitic. And that's, of course, not true. Um, this comes from a long round of targeting women of color, other communities of color, to represent themselves as that parasitic figure. So the, the failure there of mostly white public sector unions to understand why their well-being and life and claims were deeply tied to and dependent on these previous rounds of demonization actually set them up because they thought they were indemnified from these attacks. I mean, I think literally these mostly white public sector workers, toll booth collectors, janitors, you know, building inspectors are shocked that they are somehow now being named as culpable for this calamity. But of course, that was – they're the latest um, group who, is, who had been defined in this way. One thing that jumped out at me, and this was just a really fascinating analysis, I knew about what happened in Ohio a little bit, but I thought about it as – a situation involving the right overreaching and attacking cops and firefighters, but the your analysis of the way that nurses were incorporated into this category of first responders was really interesting because nurses can be represented in two very different ways as part of, on the one hand, as part of this caring economy alongside teachers or this more kind of masculinized producerist category of first responders. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So they're clearly aligned. I mean, and it's often that the nurses and sometimes the teachers tended to always appear next to the firefighters and officers, again, in these very gendered roles. But think also of the way teachers could operate in both those ways, either as the kind of do-nothing parasite who has, you know, uh, long summer vacations at taxpayer expense, who, you know, who are, are actually responsible for the crisis in public education, to more recently in the red state revolt, uh, teachers revolt as the kind of like uh, heroes of uh, keeping together some possibility of public education. So the whole the, the, the point here is that these are sites of contestation and articulation versus already fully realized cultural figures that are just circulated in a political fight. Yeah, and there's like the pathologized teacher that we got to know thanks to the bipartisan education reform movement, which has thankfully sort of passed its prime, in contrast to sort of the, the, the Teach for America teacher, which is two very different representations of teacher, the latter more rooted in the the, the iconography of like Michelle Pfeiffer and Dangerous Minds, the, the, the heroic white teacher going in to save children of color. But the shift with teachers is really interesting because there was this bipartisan support for for a parasite framework, which set up TFA and the reformers as the sort of producer as teachers against the parasite unionized teachers. But but that framework has sort of been shattered, beginning with the 2012 CTU strike. Mm -hmm. I mean, partly it's that teachers refused it, refused the category. And, uh, you know, and, and that was, you know, the, the uh, CTU strike is an important one because the, at the attack there, as we point out in the book, was it was partly to use Karen Lewis as a figure of voracious black parasitism over the Chicago white taxpayer, you know, and so she, she's brought out as the figure that is, is a stand-in for all public sector union teachers, right? And, and, that was, and that was the basis of so much of that campaign culturally in cartoons as well as in op-eds as well as in, in uh, campaign literature. That uh, the success of the uh, Chicago strike, and then the series of red state wildcat strikes that happened afterwards shows that the you know the ground can really shift depending on how people respond to these framings or how, respond to how they themselves are hailed. Yeah, I mean the LAUSD strike last year, I think, is also a clear example of it, where the, as you said, the kind of bipartisan hedge fund charge is if we want to understand the failures of public schools in LA, it's the teachers and their their uh, abandonment of students and communities' issues and their kind of fixation on their own conditions. And what the teachers did in their organizing is prove that materially that wasn't true. That actually, students, parents, and communities had much denser connections to them 
than they did to the the education reform group, and the strike kind of proved it. So I think there's – in contrast to the Ohio effort, which again tried to like in this like very almost exaggerated way perform the distinctions of these workers, teachers made a different move generally and demonstrated their connections to broadly the public. Daniel, this reminds – me of your of your previous work on the establishment liberal campaign against Prop 187, the the 1994 California anti-immigrant measure, which which was made on terms that ultimately conceded the right wing premise. Did the liberal establishment campaign against 187 was that was that in your mind when you were analyzing the Ohio campaign? Absolutely, because part of this is, especially at the kind of like the eve of an election, if the work hasn't been done beforehand, as the teachers demonstrated in both Chicago and Los Angeles, to build those things up, you're operating within the framework of the kind of accusations, and again, the like characterological accusations of uh, defend yourself to us. You are the source and site of our dispossession. What have you to say? And in that context, if, if no other work has happened, all you can do is say, you have me mixed up with someone else. Look at the taxes I pay. Look at the heroic work I do. Um, you, you're, you're misrecognizing me. And so I think in, in that sense, that was part of the failed effort to respond to Prop 187 in which, you know, in the downturn of California's economy in the early 1990s, immigrants who actually hadn't surfaced as the kind of site of the crisis were uh, fairly quickly offered uh, to explain the, you know, collapse of the the world's like seventh largest economy. So, and then quite similarly, the, then, the, then the failed effort to say that's not us um, actually doesn't persuade voters in that context versus I think what we learn from, um, and, and that's precisely what happens in Ohio as well. But again, what we learn, I think, from LA and Chicago, and what we have to think about is all the work in advance of that that sought not just to refute that notion, but to demonstrate people's embeddedness in a much broader vision of the public good. You dedicate a lot of your book to explaining a weird multiculturalism on the American right at a time that the American right is more racist than ever, perhaps, and or as racist as ever, and overwhelmingly white, too. The, the 2016 RNC had its fewest black delegates in a century. And you have two complementary analyses here. One, you point to, you point to prominent right-wing black Republican members of Congress like Alan West, Mia Love, and Tim Scott. And then you also look at non-white people in the extra-parliamentary far right, like Joey Gibson, the Japanese-American founder of Patriot Prayer, and to Tiny Tuisi, the Samoan Proud Boys member famous for beating up Antifa protesters. Why is today's right wing, which is so notable for the brazenness of its racism, like precisely for that and also for the overwhelming whiteness of its base, include such prominent non-white leaders? And do right wing street fighters of color like Tiny play the same role as right wing Republican politicians like West or, or different ones? They're related phenomena, but they're, they're different and they uh, grow partly out of different histories or, or genealogies. You know, to take the, the, the first one, the uh, conservatives of color who have been prominent in the GOP over the last decade or so, I mean, some of that comes out of this kind of neoliberal logic that, or kind of a, a, a reinterpretation of the very aims of the civil rights movement, uh, of the black freedom movement, uh, in a way that incorporates it into a, a Republican narrative of overcoming that uh, instead of uh, seeing these struggles as struggles, uh, you know, against an unequal set of conditions, uh, against forms of unfreedom that were both private and public, the uh, Republican version of it is to say that uh, it, the market ultimately is what frees everyone, whether it's poor white people, whether it's Latinos, whether it's poor African Americans, that the the marketplace is the thing that will ultimately provide emancipation. And so this is, you know, this is how the Cato Institute now talks about. That's how they narrate Frederick Douglass. But you know, this it, it this is not this is not to say that there are not 
uh, long-standing traditions of black conservatism, which, uh, which there certainly are, or Latino conservatism, which they certainly are, different kinds. But in, in this case, there is really what we wanted to show there or, or what we kind of observed is that it's not enough to say that this is just an exhibition of colorblindness, the way that people talk about Bush's appointment of Clarence Thomas, that there is something else here about the mobilization of blackness itself, which is key to the success of modern conservatism and modern republicanism. And you see it partly through these figures like Alan West or Tim Scott or Mia Love, uh, but you also see it on Breitbart Radio. You also see it in in the Tea Party movement. And there is, there's a way that race and race, racial signification is available for these different kinds of mobilizations, particularly in a post-civil rights era. The civil rights movement, we also argue, is so foundational to American national identity today that there's no refuting it. There's only different ways of incorporating it. And so that's that's partly what's going on. I mean, there's much more to say about and we did say in the book about Republican conservatism. But it differs from the stuff on the far right. It's it's connected to it, but th- these movements on the far right offer different valences uh, of solidarity and attack. And so you see with, with Joey Gibson and Patriot Prayer forms of multicultural alliance through violent misogyny or through anti-communism or through evangelical Christianity or through gun rights or through anti-immigrant nativism or through Islamophobia. So there's, there's many ways that you can actually make kind of multicultural appeals or marshal the idea that, you, that there are African American and Latino in particular, but also various Asian American uh, or, or other non-white groups or individuals to uh, bolster a point, to bolster a certain vision of the far right. And this is what you see in the, you know, not just Joey Gibson and Patriot Pair in Portland, but uh, the Proud Boys more generally, or various kind of like elements of what we might call street Trumpism. I think a couple other things to keep in mind. You're exactly right, Dan, that it's um, we're not reading this as some kind of um, reorganization of black public opinion, mass black public opinion. The, the, <laughs> not even close. Not even close. No, that, I mean, that is as, you know, as, as we understand it. And these formations, as you're describing, are as white as most people might imagine them. I think then, though, people think that the placement of these leaders of color is simply about masking, it's about obfuscating, it's um, to kind of deny something uh, versus that it's productive. The question we're trying to ask is why for the whitest of Tea Party formations does someone like Tim Scott – the Republican Center from South Carolina, stand in for the purest embodiment of the success of the market, of nationalism, uh, you know, to some extent patriarchy, more, much more so than a figure like Lindsey Graham and much more so than a figure like Mitt Romney, who's understood to be compromised, um, you know, not the embodiment of the, the very kind of like white populism that uh, Trumpism and the Tea Party itself are dependent on. So just like, you know, large corporations, absolutely are dependent on articulations of uh, blackness, black cultural formations, black subjectivity. I mean, right, that's the center of every corporate, you know, large corporate, you know, kind of mass marketing or much mass marketing. We shouldn't be surprised to see the right also turn to those same forms of signification that they're doing certain work for an otherwise uh, overwhelmingly white base. There's also... Diamond and Silk, the two black women who have become celebrities on the Trumpist, right? They're they're standing ovations for this group blacks for Trump whenever they enter Trump rallies is, is part of what's going on that conservatives want proof that they're not racist, something similar weirdly to the absolution that white liberals sought in Obama. Yeah, I think no question that's part of it is this idea that their politics are authorized by the idea that there's something deeper and more profound in the set of values than uh, than racism and incorporating symbolically black people, as Dan said, not obviously in terms of actual numbers, in terms of actual mobilizations, in terms of actual parts of the electorate, uh, but to have these these figures symbolically is appealing, I mean, appealing in the way maybe partly that blackface minstrelsy was appealing for such a broad swath of American history, but also... I was going to make the same comparison. <laughs> yeah, yes. It legitimates uh, something here. And p- part of it is that producerism, 
the logic of it is so deep that it, it makes it's available for these different kinds of, of uses. You can say I'm a tea partier and I believe in people wearing T-shirts that say, you know, spread my uh, work ethic, not my wealth. And, you know, clearly deeply racialized. But they can say, no, this is not racial at all. This is just, uh, you know, um, an ethic. See, I have uh, someone here who's African-American who, who, or who's Latino who will say the same thing. And ironically, they they do indeed prove that they aren't racist on the terms mm-hmm. of liberal anti-racism, this that you critique throughout the book, this ideational form of anti-racism that frames racism as purely bad and discriminatory ideas in people's heads. That's right. And that that formation would therefore itself be incompatible with the presence of people of color. So if that's the definition of what constitutes anti-racism, a kind of very thin notion of tolerance and openness to proximity, you see it time and again at Patriot Prayer rallies, but also Tea Party rallies, where they kind of mock the charges of anti-racism. They say, you know, Tim Scott, come come up here. And they're, they're kind of chortling – Uh, Because it's precisely right. Based on those terms, what would Tim Scott be doing here? Were we – was this the the foundations of this? Uh, Racism. And so it both has the effect of legitimizing – again, the other thing is like the core anti-statism that's articulated by the Tea Party and Trumpism has its most persuasive spokespeople – in representations of like the suffering that's taken place in black communities at the hands of the state. So they authorize uh, and legitimate um, a certain critique of state power that's really, really valuable to those formations. And you write that this is different from black conservatives who came to prominence during an earlier period, but who are still with us. I believe they're both still with us. Uh, Ward Connerly and Clarence Thomas, who, who you write, quote, were primarily authorized to address matters of race from a conservative perspective and to critique those demanding more robust state intervention into discrimination. By contrast, you write, Alan West, Tim Scott, Mia Love, quote, become the idealized subjects of the marketized and militarized nation, continually testifying to its exceptional qualities at a time of crisis. And these three, you write, are also really not heirs to Booker T., Washington preaching black self-help politics to black people. They are saying something and representing something to the mass base of white conservatives who love them. It's a very different form of black conservatism, you argue. Yeah, there's you know, there's some kind of affective appeal going on. I mean, if you hear, you know, Tim Scott speak to, you know, South Carolina Tea Partiers, uh, you know, he, there's no attempt to avoid, you know, regional black colloquialisms. He, in fact, depends on that in the way he speaks, in the way he talks to these largely white voters. And similar, you know, not not unlike how uh, Herman Cain would present himself. So there's, there's, a, there's that aspect to it. But there's also something else about the magic of neoliberalism here. It's the idea that if you take a, you know, standard Horatio Alger rags to riches idea and racialize it, in these ways, it's to say, as Herman Cain did, I came from, or Ben Carson, or Tim Scott again, I came from the lowest origins. I came from the most deprived conditions. I came, I, I faced the a set of challenges that were not just steeped in poverty, but in uh, racial discrimination. And I overcame all of those. I became a success through my individual ambition, which is which is key to this kind of story, right? Through my gumption, through my hard work, and through the marketplace, which allowed all this. The marketplace becomes this this thing, this 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 uh, liberatory force that that will do this work. That uh, the story of black self overcoming uh, has is even underscores something uh, even more powerful about neoliberalism in that story. Right. And the refusal to to rely on the kind of the lie that the state somehow itself is a possibility for one's like uh, protection. So the notion of black subjects becoming producerists, the exemplar of producerism, is a shift that requires our attention. And that doesn't mean, of course, that the Tea Party itself or its policies are any less steeped in white supremacy or racial hierarchy. It means that, at, at, you know, at this moment when the um, lived rea- material realities of market abandonment are becoming more acute, 
and the effort to legitimate why the market still has to be the site to which people would direct their energies, someone like Tim Scott or Alan West are far more persuasive and compelling uh, bearers of that message than, again, a figure like Mitt Romney, who doesn't sound credible in that context. Yeah, Mitt Romney is the son of a uh, former HUD secretary, presidential candidate and governor of Michigan. It's not exactly an up from his bootstraps narrative. And, and you write about... Uh, Black striving being cast as this exemplary form of good citizenship, including, very interestingly, in Mia Love's case, her parents immigrating the, quote, right way in implicit contrast to illegal immigrants. At at the 2015 CPAC, she said, quote, my challenge to the conservative movement is for us to be the group that promotes the ideas and the opportunities where people can come to this country legally, like my parents did, with $10 in their pocket and live their version of the American dream. And you note that this is, quote, not an Ayn Rand animated testimony to the virtues of selfishness, but a story of family uplift and communalism. How is it that black striving and the good immigrant ideal, which people with such an anti-immigrant president forget is still a powerful force across the American political spectrum. How do those both function to represent the sort of privatized communalism as the basis of good citizenship? And then how does that in turn, given its sort of superficial warmth, not this Randian coldness, how does that in turn still function to bolster anti-statist conservatism that that cuts food stamps and rejects Medicaid expansion. Well, I think one of the things to to be clear on here is that there are, you know, these languages or discourses are often contradictory and can be, you know, used kind of in one direction or another. So the Mia Love story would not be one that would be celebrated by Stephen Miller in the White House, right? Or Trump's no. <laughs> idea of Haiti as a shithole country. So that, you know, so there are different, you know, the, a tradition of republicanism that welcomed open borders was, you know, this was the position of the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page was open borders. And, you know, and this was the position in some ways of Reagan's position on amnesty and George H.W. Bush's position on amnesty. And Dan, you know all this from your own book. Uh, but there's forms of nativism and anti-nativism it can go can work together and as just as forms of racism and anti-racism can work together i think that uh, partly a figure like mia love is more credible to a republican base i think probably a, a couple of years ago uh, slightly more than would be the case now with kind of a, a greater emphasis on border nationalism that that you see which which then shifts some of the ground of where and how you know racism is being deployed so if you think of you know Steve Bannon once he leaves the white house uh, goes around speaking to black and latino chambers of commerce talking to people about how they have been left out how the banks and wall street have forgotten them and that they need to get a piece of the action and they need to be brought in and that they need to be part of his vision of economic populism and this is a vision of peoplehood that he sees as a realignment along the lines of the 1932 realignment and so this is bannon putting you know in his language the white working class with the black and hispanic working class against free trade, and against immigrants. And so there are, blackness and brownness can be used as a form of nationalism against immigrants, or the idea of uh, non-white immigrants can be used against uh, domestic populations of people of color, depending on how and where. These aren't entirely open discourses, but uh, context matters in terms of how and where they're used and how effectively they can be used. And at the same time, we go, we can just think about the ways that Stephen Miller and Mia Love actually work together, or, or they they do work that complements to the extent that Love defines and narrates this exemplary um, immigrant subject who, you know, similar to Tim Scott, refuses uh, any form of state dependence, demonstrates their fealty to the nation, and actually, in, in some ways, re-legitimate at a time of crisis, demonstrates why American exceptionalism is still alive and well. So. So for her notion as an uh, immigrant family from Haiti to say, I recognize that our market, our military, our faith are indeed the best in the world, deeply, deeply powerful testament and reinforces then Miller's notion of why that needs to be defended from unauthorized entrance. We've definitely seen with, with Trump, and this is a much longer history, how anti-immigrant politics can portray 
black people as American victims of foreign Latinos, whether economically or in terms of, of, of criminality and violence. We see this with, with the, the so-called angel families and angel moms that, that have really uh, become a major feature of, of Trumpist nativism. And it can even be deployed in an attempt to incorporate Latino Americans into anti-immigrant politics. If you recall, in the 2018 State of the Union address, Trump had as his guest Latino parents whose children had allegedly been killed by MS-13 members. But what's really interesting here and the pro- what the big problem is for the right is that while in the 1990s there was strong black and Latino opposition to undocumented immigrants, Daniel, you might remember the Prop 187 numbers better than I do, but a, a significant number of, of black and Latino people did indeed vote for it. Not as many as white people, but but a lot. Since then, things have changed a lot because it's become too clear, I think, that Republican anti-immigrant politics are so deeply embedded within a larger racist agenda that targets non-white people across the board. That's right. And actually, the movement in the last 10 years in particular among black voters who understand nativist politics as simply synonymous with racism and white supremacy, such that now on the aggregate, black voters are collectively more supportive of uh, immigrant rights and um, inclusive policies than on the aggregate Latino voters. So because they've discerned, again, collectively, that uh, nativist appeals aren't about protecting their well-being within the nation, they're doing other work. And I think that's an important example to think about collectively the kind of consciousness that um, refused and rejected that appeal, even as nativists for many, many years have tried to build at least even a symbolic base uh, within black communities. So this is, again, I think a case where those appeals have actually failed. But I think it's still important for figures like Miller to be at least in some proximity to others who are trying to celebrate a notion that we are indeed trying to protect some kind of multicultural nation. So this isn't the discourse that we would get from Merkel and others about the failures of multiculturalism. That's not what's being argued here. It's actually the nativism, the exclusion is in defense of the multicultural nation who uh, would be the first to suffer if um, more uh, immigrants were allowed in. Similar to this multicultural nativism as a means to at least symbolically perhaps only mostly only symbolically incorporate non-white people into the right is what's happening with the politics of civilizational war and Islamophobia and how they facilitate a sort of incorporation of black Americans and just a diverse diverse Americans into the category of the American people but that in turn to me seems like a subset of of this more pervasive, a conservative expression of a more pervasive multicultural military nationalism, which celebrates the diversity of the armed forces against common enemies. How does that work? Why is it that the Proud Boys can have these prominent street fighters of color, but organize themselves around the principle of Western chauvinism? Or what is Alan West doing when he warns against, quote, radical Islamist belligerents who transport the seventh century ideologies that are anathema to the values of American and Western civilization. What work is being done? I mean, I think that part of what you're pointing out is white supremacy itself isn't just defined by um, it, it, it needs it, if were it were it more inclusive, it by definition wouldn't be white supremacy. It's actually constituted also through a set of political commitments that understands hierarchies of civilization, of worlds, that certain people are destined to predicated to forms of uh, violence and degradation. So Non-white figures can be incorporated into that worldview and into that project. And so at its base, it still is deeply imperialist, militaristic, colonial, and indeed white supremacist. But it can be, and this sounds idiosyncratic, but it can be a multiracial white supremacy that's committed to all of those notions of uh, a robust militarized defense of the nation and a, a kind of deeply invest in the figure of the, the hordes waiting at the gate to, to reproduce itself. I, you know, Christianity is key to this uh, ideologically as well in ways that I think have come to the foreground in the kind of post-Cold War era, uh, you know, which is in the, in the end of the Cold War is partly the template 
probably the, the ground on which so much of this happens. But, you know, the idea of a clash of civilization, to use old Sam Huntington's words, to describe this kind of idea that now that, you know, the West is in a permanent war against Islam is one that, you know, marshals evangelical energies, marshals an idea of a set of American values, no longer as kind of the, the kind of the shared liberal democratic values that Republicans and Democrats had in opposition to Soviet totalitarianism. Now it's the idea of Judeo-Christian values against against Islam and and against China. Against Steve Bannon is would focus this in, entirely on on Asia as well. So there's there's something here that is being defended or reorganized, or there's attempts at reorganization of a, a set of values and a, and a set of political formations uh, that that you know depend partly on. Islamophobia, partly on anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is always, you know, kind of the, the the key term here for so much of this of everything else that props up, as Dan said, both white supremacy uh, and the American nation. And is is it also though the subset, a conservative subset of a broader multicultural military nationalism? Because we we can look to example to the 2016. DNC when Kazir Khan was was speaking with his wife at at his side who whose son died I believe in Afghanistan because he was a US troop saying that his son quote sacrificed his life to save his fellow soldiers while Trump had sacrificed nothing and no one he said quote have you ever been to Arlington Cemetery he's addressing Donald Trump who is watching on TV, I guess. Go look at the graves of the brave patriots who died defending America. You will see all faiths, genders, and ethnicities. And then Trump then accused Khan of not allowing his wife to speak implicitly because of the Muslim subjugation of women. What does this partisan conflict over whether multicultural military nationalism is universal enough between this conflict between the liberals and the right, universal enough to include Muslims. What does that reveal? You know, I think part of it is that, you know, obviously American imperialism is a many splendored thing and, you know, shared by political elites across both parties. And I think it's something actually that that a lot of people wanted to say about Trump in 2016 that because he comes from a a paleoconservative or a traditionally right-wing isolationist position that he would not be he would not have the same kind of appetite for empire as either uh, Bush or really Obama. I don't think it's entirely untrue, but the thing is that the, structurally the US state is an imperial state and there's no way to be commander in chief and be the American president uh, without uh, deep commitments to to empire. And now unclear that Trump gets, you know, is inspired by he's certainly not inspired by the same kind of neoconservative vision of empire that you see in both first is so strongly in George W. Bush's administration and then also in Obama's administration. But nevertheless, it's it's part of the US state and it's one that Trump will defend, you know, as a form of not as liberal internationalism, but internationalist nationalism, you know, maybe is a way to say it. Uh, so uh, in, in that context, the United States sees itself as at war with other empires, with countries that, with imperial ambitions like Iran. Uh, but I, I actually don't think that there's the same kind of um, 20th century post-World War II order appetite for this imperialism in the same in the same way that uh, w- with the Trump administration in terms of its relationship to multiculturalism or multiracialism. It's not like he would say to Kazir Khan, like not letting his wife speak is not unlike Laura Bush saying that we're going to uh, liberate the women of Afghanistan through this war. But in the case of the Bush administration, there was uh, a deep commitment to doing to doing just that, what they thought was a form of liberation. And I, I'm not sure it's the same thing here. And, and to the extent that American imperialism always is predicated on American exceptionalism, which legitimates it as not imperial, um, there's, you know, both of the 2016 DNC and the kind of like 
The, the, the multiracial constitution of the U.S. military today uh, demonstrate that. It's actually key to it. So again, we have a site. Militarism is foundational to a global ordering, uh, racial ordering on the one hand. And on the other hand, it requires us not just an appearance, but an incorporation, a multicultural incorporation to legitimate itself. I'm Aziz Rana, and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here, and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is All-American Nativism, How the Bipartisan War on Immigrants Explains Politics as We Know It, which is, funnily enough, by me, Daniel Denver. It is often said that with the election of Donald Trump, nativism was raised from the dead. After all, here was a president who organized his campaign around a rhetoric of unvarnished racism and xenophobia. Among his first acts on taking office was to block foreign nationals from seven predominantly Muslim countries from entering the United States. But although his actions may often seem unprecedented, they are not as unusual as many people believe. This story doesn't begin with Trump. For decades, Republicans and Democrats alike have employed xenophobic ideas and policies, declaring time and again that, quote, illegal immigration is a threat to the nation's security, well-being, and future. The profound forces of all-American nativism have, in fact, been pushing politics so far to the right over the last 40 years that, for many people, Trump began to look reasonable. As Daniel Denver, me, argues, issues as diverse as austerity economics, free trade, mass incarceration, the drug war, the contours of the post-9-11 security state, and yes, Donald Trump and the alt-right movement, are united by the ideology of nativism, which binds together assorted anxieties and concerns into a ruthless political project. All-American nativism, how the bipartisan war on immigrants explains politics as we know it. By me, Daniel Denver. Out now, from Verso Books. You argue that the, the current situation complicates a well-known analysis of American politics, most famously put forward by political scientist Roger Smith, which holds that our history and present are characterized by this conflict between, on the one hand, an exclusionary racial nationalism, people like Trump, versus an inclusionary civic nationalism, people like Obama. You argue that those two things, if I understand you right, have never been so much opposed or opposites uh, so much as inextricably this single multifaceted dynamic and contradictory force. Indeed, you write, quote, Barack Obama's political rise exemplified these dual modalities as he was represented as both a fantasized racial threat to American national identity, either as a socialist or foreign-born usurper, and as the clearest evidence of national redemption and exceptionalism. How do these two modalities feed into and ultimately necessarily make one another? And explain Smith's framework and what what right-wing multiculturalism suggests is at work instead. The notion of like dueling and competing and mutually exclusive traditions in which one imagines, you know, something like a white ethnostate and another imagines a pluralistic incorporation is actually not accurate or in any way nuanced uh, description of how the nation has constituted itself. Unlike in European formations where on the far right you actually can see calls for a, a, a purification and a white ethnostate, those uh, forces are on the margin. The, the notion that the, the, the nation itself is foundationally not white alone. And this dates back to the 19th, you know, 18th and 19th century is critical. Think about the Boston Tea Party, you know, the kind of uh, recurring tropes of playing Indian, of minstrelsy, et cetera. So 
So that's just, I think, we have to describe as like empirically inaccurate about the constitution of those movements. And the other is to pay attention to the forms of nationalism that that at least both appeals seek to legitimate because they are still rooted in the kinds of violences, exclusions, and hierarchies that might be necessary to seize on the exceptionality of the American state. So that's part of what, I mean, Obama's difference is not to draw the U.S. into a different kind of relationship with the world or to argue for a new articulation of economic distribution. It's to legitimate the U.S.'s standing as both empire and the the center of the market economy. So in that sense, they're both deeply committed to forms of hierarchy and domination and a certain kind of U.S. exceptionalism. Neoliberal and and right-wing multiculturalism have both abstracted blackness and diversity from historical struggles of of oppressed people. But then, really weirdly and recently, we have Trump's Super Bowl ad where he takes credit for getting criminal justice reform done that, that no one else before him could, which is a remarkably, just as a fact check, a remarkably cynical take on a really modest bipartisan measure. I'm free to hug my family. I'm free to start over. This is the greatest day of my life. My heart is just bursting with gratitude. I want to thank President Donald John Trump. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. But this is Trump's big Super Bowl ad, the biggest ad event of the year. What do you make of of Trump appropriating blackness as not just something merely abstracted from the black freedom struggle, but actually appropriating blackness as as part of a black freedom struggle that he is helping to lead? That's like a turn in in this that I hadn't seen coming. I mean, it's interesting that the immediate response to uh, that ad on social media and elsewhere was, what? Oh, my God, how could he do that? Uh, Trump's a racist. Or what? Or he's the last guy who should be talking about <laughs> uh, bringing families back together, given you know, family separation policy on the border. And in a way, it, if that's true, then why would Trump have done that ad? If, it was, if, you know, if it's self-consciously cynical to a degree that is obvious to everyone and in a way that should be uh, anathema to what his supporters want, then there would be no reason to have done that ad. And yet, as you say, extraordinary amounts of money were put into this one ad during the Super Bowl, which means that it actually matters in some fundamental way to Trump and Trump's 2020 campaign. And so then you have to start asking, you know, what's this about then on some other ground? Like, why why would Trump choose this as something that's exemplary of who he is and of who his campaign is and what his campaign is? And I bet a lot, I haven't read the analysis, but I bet a lot of media have misanalyzed it as an attempt for Trump to chip off more of the black vote, which I don't think is what's going on necessarily. Uh, either chip off some of the black vote or to appeal to Republican centrists would be the other one. That's what people used to say about George W. Bush as well, is that this having a lot of people of color on stage at his political conventions or RNC conventions was to soften his uh, hard right edges. And that is also inadequate as uh, a response to this as well, because there's we know that tr- that's not ever what Trump does. He never attempts to soften his edges. He never tries to uh, be bipartisan and reach across in any kind of way that, that makes him appealing to a broader center. That is, that he's, nothing about his successes politically has ever gone in that direction at all. But there is something here then about what it means to, it's a riddle kind of, to have black women at the center of this campaign. And there's, it's, it's interesting because if you think about it, well, we, we've talked already in this interview about kind of the redemptive power of blackness and really the kind of availability of the redemptive power of blackness symbolically and culturally for many different political actors. And that's certainly a big part of this. You know, there's a, there's a way in which, you know, if you think about what would it have meant to have a white woman in that ad? Uh, plenty of white people are behind bars. Plenty of white women and white mothers are behind bars. It would have been, in some ways, drawn out Trump's kind of base support of it would have it would have 
kind of reasserted this notion of white deplorables in a way that uh, would not have had the same kind of strong appeal of Trump as a representative of the people more broadly. Because marking white people as incarcerated would have also marked white people as criminal. Yes, Yes, that's exactly right. And would, you know, in some way maybe underscore Trump's own criminality. Uh, and, and to have had a Latino mother would have been too closely associated with family separation policy at the border, I think, and certain kinds of nativism, which are so key uh, to Trump. But to have a, a black woman both to thank him personally, there's a, a bunch of things going on in that ad. It's a brilliant ad, really. But the, the, the fact that it's, you know, it's in black and white with this kind of slow piano music in the background, it's kind of subtle and understated. Trump then, it, the Trump campaign claims for Trump this, uh, this prison reform. This woman, Alice Evans, in the ad thanks Donald John Trump personally for this. And he can be kind of a figure of himself of, of as a liberator, as a strong leader. It's kind of like a classic authoritarian populist move in a way that he can kind of cut through the bureaucracy. Uh, liberals and Democrats can claim that they do this, that, and the other. They can claim that they stand on behalf of black people. But he's the true father protector. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think it's, you know, again, we think of it like, how could it be that this ad would be addressed to the same constituency and audience that we might imagine at a typical Trump rally, where the exact, you know, seemingly kind of opposite notes are sounded again and again about the racialized threat and the need to preserve the kind of like status of the white populace. Such that, but we understand also that uh, Alice Johnson's release here is not meant to stimulate, well, is this not coming at my expense? I thought you were our protector and now you're going after them. It's actually meant to legitimate Trump's capacity to protect the very same disavowed white populace, the deplorables, because here she stands in for someone whose experience with both kind of forms of like state, not state violence, but a, a kind of uh, an overreaching state that people can't count on for any possibility in their lives, um, she's testifying to that. And it's Trump, so in this way, it's Trump's appeal to the very same white populist base it, it, uh, to kind of establish his credentials as the figure, the singular figure that can take on the state um, here. And so she's, so in that sense, her blackness is really important to an appeal to this white base. One thing we haven't discussed on this yet that's really important is your argument about the alt-right's origins in men's rights activism and how gender is key to how right-wing multiculturalism functions. You write, quote, performed as patriarchal traditionalism, online ultra-misogyny, or street brawling bravado, masculinity bridges racial difference for populist, fascist, and even white nationalist politics. And, quote, violent masculinity is the identity and practice that brings together explicit racists with fascist people of color. How is it that gender politics facilitate a more multicultural far right? And is this something that's just operating on the, the proud boy street fighting level? Or, or does this analysis also apply to high profile right wing Congress people of color? Well, to take the first part of that question, I think... Uh, there have been people who have done extraordinary work on the relationship of gender to the far right. M Matthew Lyons, who has a, a great blog called Three Way Fight, he's a longtime analyst of the far right, has talked about the way that g gender is is as key as race is to the uh, f uh, to present day far right formations. There's a, a scholar named Alex DeBranco who has done great work um, on masculinism, or, or what she calls um, uh, masculine supremacy uh, as a movement which is uh, which is extraordinarily dangerous and potent and you know comes out of you know these 4chan and 8chan these you know these internet message boards originating partly in Gamergate, which I won't go into detail here about, but... It was a conflict about ethics and video game journalism, just to yeah, clarify. Yes. great. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> uh, and so that, that gender and misogyny were, were key to the, the very formation of the alt-right at its origins in a way that uh, deeply anti-feminist and anti-woman. And uh, as, as DeBranco points out, 
all the uh, the mass killings over the last decade uh, that we associate with the far right have been as much about misogyny as they have been about white supremacy. Uh, that you know, the, the San Diego killing, the uh, Umpqua Community College killing. There's plenty of others that were driven by incel inspired or you know men's movement hostile men's movement inspired men who angry and resentful towards women see women as withholding sex from them as as somehow getting ahead of them in in ways that 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 are able to generate this extraordinary rage and so uh, that kind of far right masculinity and you know the the most toxic kind of masculinity can can uh, be something that can cross um, racial lines as it as it does in the Proud Boys. One thing that is new about it is gender has always been key to the far right, but if you think of kind of Nazi-era iconography, uh, you think of um, kind of natalism and, and women as mothers and producers of a, of a new generation of, of, you know, young white Aryans. And that's... Uh, or like the white... The, it's no coincidence that the white supremacist 14 words ends with future for white children. Yes, yeah. But what's strange about about some of this kind of new incel far-right misogyny is that it's it's less about natality and less about a, f- a future uh, and more about just hatred of women generally. It's as if the, the possibility of reproducing the white race has been replaced with just this kind of nihilistic rage toward women. And so this can be something that allows the possibility of, of, of at least the possibility of identifications or appeals across a race line to other men who will who will who can join this movement but i mean it operates in another register as well so i'll give you an example uh, patriot prayer in portland especially last year had a series of rallies that i think were described as him to rallies and what they were meant to summon was sympathy for all of these men who had been falsely or at least reflexively not just accused of sexual violence exploitation and assault but convicted of it in the public and for that to work, and it, it's a, a proxy for a broader attack on feminism and what feminism has eroded. For that attack to work, the men of color in Patriot Prayer, who are key in their leadership, had to testify from their position, uh, their racialized position. We know, invoking the histories of lynching, what it's like to be falsely accused of these crimes. And therefore, we're here to say, in this very like intimate language, I see you, brother. Talking to a you know a white guy, I know what that's like. So in there, it's set up not just as the kind of quite violent end of misogyny, but as a broad, broad critique of the overreaches of feminism and uh, uh, an incorporation into a kind of traditional patriarchy. To answer the second part of your question, for us, producerism is is absolutely always gendered. And we talked about this earlier in the interview. But it's it's by necessity this kind of you know idea that. In American political history, producers were artisans or farmers or industrial workers or the ones who who uh, added value through their uh, virtuous efforts were men. And the I and so what what's valued is kind of a certain kind of um, work and labor efforts associated with masculinity. And so this is one of the things that, of course, Trump also campaigned on. Right? Is this this notion of of, of men as losing, uh, losing up, losing something in their masculinity, losing something in and who they are, how they value themselves. And so you can you can see how then violence as a response is kind of a logical response to this. This assertion of masculine power through a traditional masculine way of asserting power through violence. This is really in- interesting because there's this long-standing, more general way in which reproduction and gender are central to racism very much in a way that's not exclusive at all to the far right. If you look at the pathologization of black and Latina mothers in reproduction that facilitated welfare reform, for example, or Prop 187 in, in California, which was also a welfare reform bill in a sense. There's that. And then in the white right wing imaginary, this idea that feminism has undermined the role of white reproduction while Latina reproduction is figured as out of control, overtaking whites demographically through anchor babies and the reconquista. But then and and this that that all I've thought a bunch about before, but then what you're arguing is that it can all that can all just become abstracted as a sort of anti woman nihilism. Yeah, and one that actually, again, feels productive in that it invites men 
mostly white men, but some men of color, into a notion, into a gendered notion of defense that is actually tied to all of these broader questions around anti-statism, around producerism, et cetera. In other words, it doesn't just have to be cast as like individual affect of chauvinism as much as it's a symptom of a much broader erosion. And in Patriot Prayer, they would tie that to erosion of family structures, uh, faith, uh, et cetera. So there's a way in which these attacks, we can't just isolate them as a kind of like a psycholo- psychologicalized uh, chauvinism, but are actually show the links between a restoration of patriarchy and a broader critique of uh, the state itself. And it's not just men as as victims, but also men as failures and both simultaneously and the it, similar to the way that that Trump is both casting his audience as 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 losers and victims at the same time because the proud boys aren't just saying that men are the victims of women but their whole rule about not jacking off that men are kind of undermining their own vitality and masculinity yeah and that actually in these very i mean there there's another kind of transposition as well on on one hand these very like intimate r- relations as the starting point i mean it's partly part of why for um the proud boys men of color were so key to their early iteration as embodying a certain kind of masculinity that the over you know out of control feminism or an overreaching state couldn't affront so that depended on that defense of patriarchy defended on um a racial logic it's almost as if what the Proud Boys offer is is instead of a you know a racial uplift, it's kind of a gender uplift. You know, a, a certain way this the the no wanking, the kind of um, uh, <laughs> you know, which is part, which actually uh, it was a you know a black comedian who was an early Proud Boy associate is the one who who uh, who came up with the no wanking rule. Wow. As a kind of counsel to white men, right? If you want to, this is part of what it means to actually live your masculinity. Yes, yeah, as a kind of a masculine honor. And so, you know, Gavin McGinnis is, is impresario and kind of a huckster. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot going on with him. But partly the, the Proud Boys depend on a certain kind of transgression as well as a restoration of masculine honor. And those two things are obviously always connected. And the Proud Boys need to exhibit this through action, through, you know, kind of action through It's kind of almost a, you know, kind of an early, you know, like we would associate with, you know, fascism in the 20s as a street politics. And this, th- this masculine uplift in turn, to bring it full circle, depends on the racial valorization of men of color, or which is also, of course, twinned with a racist demonization of men of color, is hyper-masculine. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In the case of Tiny, in particular, but I'm sure there are other cases as well. Well, I think uh, the part of Tiny's appeal and part of why he is beloved among Proud Boys, kind of like generally, uh, and certainly in the Pacific Northwest, is that he he is represented as a figure of extraordinary violence. You know, there was this, we write in the book about and the alt-right rally that happened just uh, five days after Jeremy Christian killed two people and severely wounded a third on a, on a mass transit train in, in Portland. Uh, he's a, a, a white supremacist mass killing. Tiny leads all these alt-right supporters in a park in Portland in a haka, in a, in a Polynesian uh, traditional uh, war party dance before going out to confront anti-fascists. And so you've got here you've got Tiny leading all these white alt riders in this kind of masculinized ritual of violence uh, march out against anti fascists and, and within days after this killing had taken place. And so there's some extraordinary uh, theater happening there, which is in, inciting the affectations of of these alt right followers. All in all, your your argument is one that people might find provocative in that. You're saying that the entire far right is racist, but they are not all Nazis, and that indeed the far right is stronger for their incorporation of people of color. There's this idea that the alt alt light might be a gateway drug to white power groups, but you write what's more important is that, quote, it is the liminal space in which white supremacy and multiculturalism interact that generates meaning and power for the far right. But there's this tendency to identify and conflate the entire far right with literal Nazis, when instead, it's profoundly important to understand the right wing in all of its terrifying 
diversity. What do we miss if we fail to make these distinctions? Well, I, I think, for example, if we think back to the second uh, kind of iteration of Charlottesville, the rally that was held, I think, last summer in Washington, D.C., that a small, maybe a couple of dozen of kind of avowed white supremacists, n- Nazis, showed up to, and a far greater number of counter demonstrators, and it's understood as a kind of failure. Uh, the same weekend in Portland, a more multiracial group of several hundred um, led by Patriot Prayer and their allies in the Power Boys held actually a provocative and quite successful rally. What we miss there is the actual uh, politics, commitments, violences, and worldviews that helped to constitute and organize that Proud Boy rally because we don't have the language to critique it the way we do Charlottesville and, you know, the more traditionally legible uh, white supremacist figures because our, our language is kind of confined to look at their affect, look at their hate, look at their disposition, look at what they're drawn to or not which is important, but it's not the only thing that defines their worldview. It's also about their commitment to um, militarism, nationalism, their critique of the state, their reliance on demonization in general. So that's part of what we miss is actually what constitutes, what does it mean to be right-wing in that sense, and how that is in in no way exclusive or eliminate some notion of a kind of multiracial uh, or... um, membership. I mean, it's also, you know, it's as the the far right, as we describe it there, is kind of just American history writ small, right? The United States has always been a white supremacist, you know, settler colonial and slavery and post-slavery regime. But it has always depended on blackface and on on red face, on Indian place names everywhere, on kind of the idea that other people are incorporated into this project under in hierarchical terms, but always incorporated in this project. And the way that Toni Morrison talks about the the centrality of blackness to all American cultural production, even at its widest and most white supremacist. It, there's something here which is deeply American, and American white supremacy always drawing its energies from its depictions of people of color, that this is fundamental in terms of some actual labor and symbolic labor and cultural labor uh, to uh, projects of, of white supremacy generally. And I had some of my most hellish days ever on in my Twitter mentions when sometime last year I noted that calling Trump a fascist can be a way to make Trump seem like the product of of something foreign rather than of fundamentally fundamental things that have been core to the United States since before its founding. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Were it only that racism were only born, reproduced, uh, carried and legitimated by something on what we would call the extreme and absent that, but for that, we would have a kind of egalitarian uh, nation committed to possibility for everyone. So what I, that does is it disavows the much more, as Joe was saying, structuring ways that race legitimates and reproduces the, the, the longstanding um, forms of dominance domination that constitute everyday life in the country. And I think you can see by comparison, if you look at far-right movements in Sweden, in Austria, in Hungary, you know, throughout Northern and Central Europe and Western Europe as well, these far-right formations are premised on kind of racial eliminationism, on the idea that, that Muslims have to go, the idea that non-white people have no place in Europe, the idea that they, these are countries and cultures rooted historically in white DNA. I mean, this is what you, this is what you get always in these, in these European far-right parties. And, it's, and it actually, by contrast, the U.S. Because their xenophobia is a xenophobia of the post-colonial metropole, whereas ours is dealing with the contradictions of, of settler colonialism. That's exactly right. Settler colonialism and slavery. Your book is ends with a really interesting analysis of the 2016 right-wing militia occupation of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge in Oregon, led by the Bundy family. And there's a lot in your analysis, but but to start, you note the key role played by the mystification and normalization of settler colonial violence, something that is far from unique to the right. It's foundational to the entire country. But in the case of, of these right-wing protesters, you, or militants we might call them, you argue that it's precisely that that allowed for them to position themselves 
as self-sufficient rural people who had gained rights to their property through, as Locke would put it, mixing their labor with nature. And then to see this dynamic, and then to see their, their predicament as the result of this dynamic having been upset by federal government encroachment on Western land. And obviously this mythology facilitates anti-indigenous violence and dispossession and always has, but you write that it also poses a problem for rural white people because it mystifies the roots of their own condition because the conditions have gotten really hard for rural white people. And the mystification of this mystification causes them to see the federal government's control of land as the reason why, when in fact, of course, federal control over land was the thing that powered Western expansion in the first place. And then what's more, in Harney County, Oregon, where the reserve is, nearly half of all employment is in the public sector. So just this general question about your argument, how is it that, quote, the more people in rural Oregon are abandoned by the state, the greater the possibility for anti-statist sentiment to grow. Explain this and how it's rooted in longstanding dominant ideologies of independence and dependency that are tied to the very foundation of this country. Thinking about the conditions first that led to the occupation for a moment is important or the immediate kind of impetus, which is a farmer in uh, Eastern Oregon who had been given um, a, a mandatory minimum sentence um, because uh, of, of this uh, conviction about um, setting these controlled burns on his property. Um, and it was a conflict with the Bureau of Land Management there. R regardless of that outcome, he the— The fire spread to BLM land, right? That's right, and that's partly what legitimated it. They'd actually served part of the sentence, um, were released, and th thought they were going to— and then were required, actually, to serve again. So we have to take that seriously because what they're actually— the impetus for it is a mandatory minimum sentence that's the hallmark of mass incarceration. And that comes from the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, this draconian— mass incarceration, war on terror, early pr proto-war on terror law signed by Bill Clinton. That's right. Um, and that it's, you know, Obama administration prosecutors that are demanding the full uh, weight and, uh, uh, of that law be applied to this family, to this father and son. Um, second, the, you know, the conditions we point out, both in Harney County but also southern Oregon, um, in which the local economy has been so eviscerated Basic public services, libraries, 911 service, basic responses to emergency have withered to, the, um, to, to almost be non-existent. So these are parts of the conditions to which uh, – that actually legitimate the Bundys first coming to try to defend the family and then announcing we're going to seize this wildlife refuge. It's a bird refuge as this kind of symbolic retaking of the land so that we can generate new possibilities from ourselves from these producerist and colonial relationships. The Burns Paiute tribe had said, look, we also have a longstanding critique of what the federal government has done to our lands. And if you want to talk about the role of land in life and, and, you know, and statism, we'll have a conversation about that. And their actually inability to hear that, to think about what prior regimes of colonialism and land theft have to also do with the intense precarity of small towns in Oregon is key because instead of those possibilities – and listening to the, those communities and groups that have had the long-standing experience with these uh, uneven relationships with the state and the land, they instead kind of only thing in their political repertoire is to like symbolically reperform a claiming of the land, even though obviously there's no connection between the occupation of a bird refuge and the, any potential for the revitalization of these communities. Yeah, and you know, the on the other side of it, liberals tended to mock the Malheur takeover and, you know, calling them... It, it infuriated me, infuriated me at yes, the time. Yes, calling y'all Qaeda or yihadism or whatever else. Or vanilla ISIS. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a way of, of completely delegitimizing. You know, you, th you think of Portland and Multnomah County, where Portland is, 
It's an incredibly wealthy area, and, and there's there's lots and lots of money and wealth in in Portland, and there's lots of and that is money that's not redistributed throughout the state. We, there are really right wing tax laws built into the Constitution now since the 1990s, which makes it uh, difficult to redistribute wealth throughout Oregon. But th- it is a, a comfortable situation that wealthy liberals are will will, com- will defend over and over, and will will fight against uh, referenda that seek to redistribute wealth. And so here they are looking out uh, at eastern and southern Oregon, shaking their head at these redneck evangelical zealots as if they've got, as if these are not people who have claims to the state or against the state or to, or, or, or cannot say we live in a failed state and we, we, need, uh, we, we need resolution to this. We need to find some way to uh, to save ourselves. And that's why the militias became important in these areas to begin with. That's how they gained credibility to start with, because they were the only ones intervening and saying, we want to help take care of these problems. We want to help make this a survivable land for you. They, you know, are running classes in small animal butchering and sewing and pouring uh, the cement for wheelchair ramps for veterans and doing this all kinds of other work uh, in these areas, which made them more credible, not to everybody, of course, but to make them actually a, a, a more legitimized political and military force in, in some of these areas of Oregon. And liberal, some liberals even, I remember very clearly, were criticizing the government for not repressing the militants more severely, this idea that racial justice somehow would be them being as severely punished as black ins- insurrectionaries would be. It was utterly unreal. Yeah. And aligning themselves, therefore, with the state police and the FBI and all the kind of power of state violence. I mean, pointing out rightly that the kind of the, the reluctance to simply storm the occupation and slaughter people, uh, we could imagine a different outcome if it had been a black social movement that had done that. That we can accept that as true, but then to invoke, we want this. the The resolution here is for state violence to be brought to bear on them as something representing equity. Um, is indeed it shows kind of like how diminished because I, I don't think we don't want to certainly we want to have a clear critique of the Bundys of the forms of militancy right. and violence they represent. And there were lots of organizers on the ground doing that who understood the the deep threat they made. But the way to do that isn't then to argue, you know. Yes, the, the mandatory minimums should be applied to them full-throated. Yes, uh, the power of the, of the state and the FBI should be brought to bear against them, um, which is in some ways what the politics cohered around. Yeah, I mean, because obviously, like, it is important to point out the the racial disparity seemingly evident from the response and obviously to oppose the right-wing politics and the, the massive mystification and obfuscation of reality that it rests upon. But at the end of the day, we have liberals sing, sort of singing out of the same hymn book as the National Review's Kevin Williamson, pathologizing white rural people using racist frameworks. Mm-hmm. As opposed to structural frameworks. And you, you know, you'll often hear in a place like Oregon, you know, there's this corridor along the interstate freeway, the five, that represents kind of like committed equitable values. But stray from that and you're entering this kind of like territory of – it is very much of like political dysfunction, uh, the, the kind of the, the wretched people, and such that when people make appeals to for, for forms of redistribution, the, the response is very much, this is, you're the authors of this failure, and this is a sign of, of why you actually don't have the standing to make that claim. This is also related to this liberal and establishment analysis that presumes that we were discussing earlier that racism is a static force in American history and that also that tribalism is this basic feature of social life, which is sort of a corollary to racism as a static force. And so the only way out then, you know, these people on Twitter weren't looking for a way out. They were just sort of embracing this kind of liberal race realist nihilism. But then for those who are, you know, trying to propose solutions like Amy Chua, you know, the, the only, the only solution is to have conversations with our fellow Americans, you know, on the other side of the tribal divide. (laughs) 
Yeah, this assumption that these are already formed um, internally coherent groups that actually do operate under different mores, different commitments, and that that's already fully formed. And the conflict simply represents the playing out of that versus understanding these are, you know, much more fluid sense. I mean, you can imagine a different there, – there have been organizers in Oregon working for many decades on addressing mandatory minimums, largely on behalf of the communities of color that have been affected by them. So to, to embrace the tribal notion is to say that a farm rancher also struggling with a different articulation of mandatory minimums would actually have no political grounds to engage let's say, black and brown communities in Portland and elsewhere in a critique of the criminal justice system. And that's, that just actually forecloses political possibilities for generating the kinds of movements that could be transformative and instead defines them as mere kind of cultural alienations from one another. And an irony here is that many liberals believe in racism's promise that racism works as advertised, that, as you write, quote, whiteness is a magic amulet that protects everyone who identifies as white from the ravages of economic predation and state violence, which ultimately, quote, will narrow the social and political base that might resist conditions. It's like an anti, it's an anti-solidarity politics, not actually an anti-racist politics. It's kind of a racist politics. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, it seeds from our perspective uh, possibilities. So we discuss uh, a group called the Rural Organizing Project, a statewide project in Oregon that's based not just in white rural communities because the, uh, the rural Oregon is not just white. But they're very actively trying to work and think about the forms of precarity and deprivation and death that are becoming more ubiquitous in white rural Oregon towns and how that does relate actually to the conditions in places like Ferguson and Baltimore and onto the border. This is not just a kind of Pollyannish appeal to human solidarity. It's actually trying to get people to think quite seriously about how an ICE detention center in, um, you know, just over the, the border in, in Washington relates to the longstanding experiences of, of abandonment in southern and eastern Oregon. That's work to be made and forged and built. It can't just be assumed. But the, the kinds of like the, the tribalism discourse, which just presumes that a priori alienation for closes any possibilities for it. You write along these lines, quote, white efforts to promote racial justice are not realized through bland forms of allyship to support people of color around their issues, but forged through a recognition of the interdependence between racially subordinated communities fighting their abandonment and heightened forms of white precarity. I love this sentence Explain what allyship, this profoundly liberal hijacking of leftist social justice politics that kind of functions as a substitute for the concept of solidarity, what, what that misunderstands about how systems of domination function and about the materiality of ideology, and then in turn, how we should instead think of solidarity as a practice that can transform ideology. Yeah, I think that we want to say on the one hand that the kind of like the political paucity of a concept like allyship, when it just means supporting someone else in their struggles, uh, is not something that can ever go anywhere because it's not something that's – they're not sh shared values, um, shared interests, the idea that there, there's something that you can forge together that will emancipate everyone. And so that, you know, that's something that is not, you know, you know, it's a certain kind of liberal paternalism at the end of the day. On the other hand, we don't want to say that that all struggles are the same and that there should be kind of a an undifferentiated sense of what different struggles face or different communities face, right? So that white precarity is different. What people in eastern and southern Oregon face is different than what people face in Flint, Michigan or uh, the state uh, predation that, that you find in Ferguson or what people face on the border. Nevertheless, there's many things that they have in common in terms of who their enemies are, who are the ones uh, preying on them. And uh, There's a difference between recognizing difference to build solidarity, which is which is critical. We can't, as, as you're saying, presume kind of universal categories and universal politics, if only it were so easy. But but there's a difference between that and fetishizing and naturalizing difference. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, differences are, you know, they're not 
they're not natural and they are not static and they, you know, and you don't want to reify experiences or people's, you know, you know, racialized identities. On the other hand, uh, you do have to f- start from where people are. And I think for us, w- one key thing is that the struggles of people of color have often been the ones that open up emancipatory possibilities for everyone else. Or or another way of saying it is like we were talking about the Bundys and the militias in Oregon. Kind of a, a settler colonial mindset is exactly what stands in the way of of these folks finding other forms of solidarity and possibilities of liberation. And so that's what we were trying to begin to get at in the conclusion is how would we think about, how would we think about what George Lipsitz calls accompaniment instead of allyship in terms of what kinds of solidarities can be forged under what conditions? Yeah, and I think what it requires us to think about is not just intrinsic characteristics, but different distinct relationships to power and that we can think actually those those relationships to power don't have to be the same in other words the the ways that the state abandonment has happened in southern oregon are quite different than the way they've happened in detroit but they do name a certain relationship to power that's important for us to understand and think through and it's partly why we turn to a tradition of women of color politics and theorizing that that actually has a long standing practice of that that understands women of color itself was not meant to be a singular term capturing all forms of that experience it was meant to be a practice in which you could think through sites of difference in order to offer a political critique of power and you know to to concretize this you know, there was this incident that happened several years ago in southern Oregon where a person was killed um, along by a driver along a, a highway. And with no police presence, no investigative presence, no promise of it, um, the, the person's relatives were left to just hold a, a sign by the road saying, does his life matter to anyone? That experience of trying to appeal to the state and saying, does my life matter to anyone, there's longstanding practices and traditions and genealogies to address that. But they don't lie in settler colonial takeovers of a bird refuge. They lie in other forms of emancipatory movements. And I think that that those are the forms of relationality that hold the most potential to link together what would happen in Southern Oregon with long-standing visions of transforming the state. And I think the point is if that doesn't happen, it's the militias that offer a far more uh, seductive and, you know, arguably like effective response, which is if you want redress, you stay with us and uh, return to these producerist commitments. So, you know, for instance, to give another example, Trump gave this uh, uh, speech at a rally in Minnesota, kind of an election campaign rally in Minnesota in October. And in that speech, he used this, you know, this horrible language, uh, redolent of great replacement theory. About, uh, Somali uh, refugees. The Somali community. Yeah, horrible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in saying that Democrats will, uh, you know, will send waves and waves of, of refugees your way if, if uh, they get back in power. And so there's a, the, the liberal response to that speech was, oh, my God, that was so racist and nativist. And what a terrible way to deal with the Somalis who have been upstanding citizens and good neighbors uh, in the Twin Cities. As opposed to maybe another way of seeing it might be that Somalis in the Twin Cities and the surround, surrounding rural areas in Minnesota have been leading struggles at Amazon distribution centers, for instance, for, you know, for workers' rights to take bathroom breaks for better wages. They've been leading fights at uh, turkey processing plants or chicken farms in these outlying areas in, in ways pushing with militant labor tactics in a way that actually white people in that Trump rally might find something that they could be liberated through by taking, you know, taking the, the uh, experiences of their fellow Somali workers and their radicalism and their refusals as something to be emulated. This is how the left can break out of this twisted dynamic between the, the liberal immigration framework that represents immigrants either as the victimized refugee or the noble super citizen hard worker that's tied in that's as Bonnie Honig, uh, the political philosopher argues, tied in fundamentally to the demonization of the immigrant other. The left can break out of that by talking about the immigrant worker as core to the to the multiracial working class. Yes. Outside of a producerist framework. Yes. Well, that's the trick. <laughs> but that's the trick. But that's an important one is to say that it's not just as being virtuous citizens and hard workers, but as, you know, uh, but through traditions of 
uh, radicalism and refusal as well. So in terms of this this possibility, my last question, in terms of this possibility of building some kind of real solidarity between the rural white communities like like the one we've been discussing in Oregon and struggles historically led by working class people of color, there is a possibility. And, and, and you point to elucidate the existence of this possibility. You point to an incident that people would definitely describe as problematic. And that certainly was for all problematic for all of the the obvious reasons, but it was also something more complex was going on. It was after a man involved in the occupation, Lavoy Finnecum, was shot dead by police. There were these protests in rural Oregon where white people chanted, hands up, don't shoot. And you write that, of course, you know, this failed to sort of fully appreciate the black people's his distinctive vulnerability to state violence, but but that on the other hand, quote, the attempt to make visible some feeling of collective suffering and distress through a signifier so closely associated with black insurgency at least hints at another possibility. To close out, what is that possibility and why are so many liberals dead set on not seeing it? What your question is gesturing towards asking us to do two things that that seem contradictory, which is on the one hand, attending to the very specific histories of these violences and these experiences of subordination. Because we were constrained by this concept that unless we can name it as the same, we don't have a basis for solidarity and action. We have to eliminate and evacuate difference. Part of what we're arguing is this requires us to have a much uh, more complex understanding of how power works. Of course, capitalism, neoliberalism, these regimes differentiate people. They can't push people into equivalent, interchangeable, fungible experiences. So the, the challenge then is to think about what the relationship is across those experiences and w- what is it that would constitute uh, points of entry at these different sites to really reimagine worlds that aren't predicated and don't require uh, violence, producerism, and colonialism as their guarantee. And our argument is that those have, you know, historically come from uh, anti-racist movements based in communities of color that, that don't want to simply reproduce a regime of violence or a division between worthy and unworthy. And we're at that moment now where the po- the possibilities of protecting or in- inuring ourselves from death by claiming that we belong into the category of the valuable versus the discarded are diminishing for everyone. Uh, We realize the the category of the discarded and the destined for death is growing. And so if we're trying to figure out a politics to respond to that that doesn't reproduce it, it comes from black freedom struggles, anti-colonial struggles, which say we actually don't want to be incorporated into the system that consistently reproduces uh, these divisions. And I think that's partly what, um, you know, this moment might open up. Yeah, and, you know, finally, a point that we make at the end of the book is that, you know, our emancipation requires us to be uh, newly flexible in our associations and to see things with new eyes and to ask new questions uh, given the the kind of changed ground that we're on. And, you know, what we chronicle in the book is that that's exactly what the right and far right has done. They have been open to new associations and new identifications and to, you know, changing the language on a number of things that allow them to grow and build and flourish. And the uh, we think the left needs, you know, it, it, our own ability to be uh, flexible and open and to build identifications and associations across across lines that that people are generally hesitant to do. Well, Joe Lounce and Daniel Martinez Hosang, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having us. It was so fun. Yeah, we're really grateful. Thank you, Dan. Daniel Martinez Hosang and Joe Lounce are the authors of Producers, Parasites, Patriots, Race and the New Right-Wing Politics of Precarity. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. 
As Marx once said, after commenting on the bourgeois nursery tale about the foundation of capitalist wealth, that in times long gone by, there were two sorts of people, one the diligent, intelligent, and above all frugal elite, the other lazy rascals spending their substance and more in riotous living. Such insipid childness is every day preached to us in defense of property. In actual history, it is notorious that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, force, play the great part. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it is on iTunes or wherever, please also leave us a nice review. Those ostensibly help introduce us to new listeners. What really and truly does that, however, is you telling other people about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And last, but by no means least, please do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation going strong. Even a few bucks a month is a huge help. Thank you.